Hi everyone and welcome back to That UFO Podcast. My name is Andy and I am joined on today's show by an astrophysicist who worked as an intelligence analyst for, among several organisations, the UAP Task Force. I'd love to welcome to the podcast Sarah Gam. Sarah, welcome. Hi, thank you so much for having me here. Good to meet you. Good to have you on. Um, I was going to start off with a bigger introduction. Um, you've got a lot of acad- academic achievements behind you, a lot of organizations you've worked for in what seems a relatively short space of time as well. So I thought I'm going to leave that to you, Sarah. And if we can kick off, first off, we've got a whole load of places to go with this podcast, Sarah. Um, and I was just saying to you before we hit record, it's going to go all over. So we've got a lot of bases to cover. So I think this is one that no matter what you are interested in with the UFO topic, there's going to be something for you here. So uh, buckle up, folks, as some folks like to say. Um, But Sarah, if you want to kick off um, your background, can you take us through your kind of academic history and some of that work history as to kind of what's brought you to this point? Yeah, it is a curvy road. So yes, buckle up. I uh, first started out doing, I initially wanted to be an astronomer. And so I started going to undergrad for that, for to be an astronomer and potentially even join the military one day because they have a really, um, a few of our military branches here in the US have good astronomy programs and you could be an astronaut through some of them. So I, through through my undergrad, I went to Missouri State University when I first started going there with Southwest Missouri States. And I would grad the, the name changed before I graduated. Um, but I ended up falling in love with physics because it was a physics based major and I was going to transfer school. So I ended up falling in love with physics more. Astronomy is a lot of theoretical work and guesswork and I, I fell in love with, you know, having the answer as number five and physics is a part of astronomy. It is astronomy. So uh, I ended up doing both. I ended up not transferring schools and loved my professors, loved my education. Uh, so I graduated on paper. It is a physics degree, but in reality, it is astrophysics. It's just legal things that the department can't have astrophysics as an actual, you know, on the paper. Um, I am actually on the advisory board for the physics department I graduated from. We just had our annual meeting last week um, that I unfortunately couldn't attend because of work. Um, And so after that, I ended up moving out to Washington, D.C. area and got my first uh, touch into the intelligence community. I... Uh, happened to be a part of a place that was more like a family. And it was a lot of undergrads that, said, I mean, a lot of people that had just graduated undergrads. That didn't make sense. Um, people that had just graduated undergrad school and we were all young and didn't have family nearby. And so we became each other's family. And that just has kind of blossomed into me leaving the area at one point and then coming back. So I've stayed in the Intel community pretty much every year of my career. Um, I mostly supported NRO or NGA. And right now I'm actually directly supporting the Air Force, the Pentagon. Um, yeah, I don't know how much much detail, but I ended up finding a love with SAR imagery, synthetic aperture radar, along this crazy journey route that I've had in my, you know, kind of still early on career and um, SAR imagery is, um, it's an active sensor. So it sends and receives signals from um, the, the sensor itself. So instead of being a passive sensor, like our, our cameras on our cell phones, that's just receiving photons, this sends and receives energy pulses. And so it's kind of like sonar on a boat. And uh, not many people like to look at the data because it is kind of hard to interpret, but there's a lot of math and and science and physics behind it. So yeah, what's not to love about it? And it's um, it ended up bringing me to an amazing project, a couple of projects where I worked at, at NGA and got a lot of exposure in the Intel world from that and a lot of very good life lessons and uh, mission that I never thought I would ever be a part of. And um, then that led me to the research directorate and I got to do really more cool things and uh, and still worked with uh, SAR imagery in a way, but I worked with bi So that's send and receive from two different sensors. 
And um, yeah, so I've basically been a nerd my whole life is I'm, I'm realizing I'm saying a lot of odd things that people might not know what they mean. Um, and, but I still like looking up at the stars and um, still, you know, tried to go out and watch the meteor shower last night, but I failed because I got tired and lazy. Um, so I guess that's a roundabout way of saying, yes, this has been a curvy road, but now I'm somehow at the Pentagon supporting the Air Force. So, And, and we'll pick that apart. So thank you for doing that, because a couple of seconds and an introduction wouldn't have done it justice. Really important, though, before we get to some of those acronyms like the NGA and what that is, um, you were a big X-Files fan growing up, uh, I've heard you say. Yes. So w- yes. what was what was the interest in UFOs and that sort of stuff early on? Um, I think it wasn't just UFOs. It was everything in general. They covered, I mean, they didn't just cover aliens. They co- covered, which I didn't realize at the time was cryptids and, and all the things. And you had Mulder who embraced the world and loved everything about it and knew that the truth was there. And, and then you had Scully who was the scientist. So I feel like I have both of those inside of me, uh, always at battle with each other. Um, yeah, it was everything in general. And I think um, a little bit more of my love for it started because I'm, I'm the youngest of my family and, and my brothers both liked it as well. So I always wanted to do everything that they did and, you know, play with, you know, He-Man toys and GI Joes and stuff. So I think they might've also had a slight influence on it. Um, but yeah, I even had an undergrad in my dorm rooms. I always had a poster. I moved room to room with me. That's a, that was the, I want to believe. The classic. And listen, I think mm-hmm. given what we're going to talk about, Mulder and Scully would have been proud of you, um, taking, taking oh. those lessons through life and, um, living the dream, I suppose, uh, as to what they wanted to do. So you mentioned the NGA and I'm going to ask you if I jump about or got the timelines wrong here. Keep me right, Sarah, um, but I want you doing most of the talking anyway. You mentioned the NGA. That's the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. If folks are mm-hmm. familiar with the acronym, then that would be the same agency David Grush was a part of, who many folks will know from last year. I don't believe you worked with David, though. You just Your, your ships never c- crossed, did they? Correct, yes. Our, our ships never crossed. Um, would Was that your first sort of major role um, you mentioned, is it SAR imagery you're saying? Yeah, SAR, yeah. yeah. Radar. Yeah. And was that the first Sorry. major role that incorporated that? Um, into the task force or? Well, role? was this, NGA was before the task force, wasn't it? Um, I worked at NGA while I was on the task force. So I was right. a part of, I started at NGA many years before the task force um, was a thing. So I, I has already, hmm, I'm trying to do a quick math. I think it, I'm, I can't remember when I started. I think it was 2013. So about six years, I was already at NGA before I got on the task. This, this makes the point of something I'm going to get to then, because it's something that's confused me over the last couple of years with the whole task force and what it is. But before then, what was your, your regular day-to-day tasks then as part of the NGA? Because just, it sounds really cool and really geeky. And you're talking about imagery. So I think in my mind, and this is absolutely not what it is, but if folks remember like Enemy of Enemy of the State, the Will Smith and Gene Hackman movie, which I am sure was maybe the catalyst for you getting that job, Sarah. You know, you've got these spy satellites in space taking pictures of your shoelaces on the street. Um, that's not quite what you were doing because it sounds a lot more complex and complicated than that. Yeah. Um, I got to I got to do a lot of really amazing stuff when I was at NGA. I have had such a fortunate career being in the right place at the right time. I first started supporting a branch um, that we were working in the Russia Eurasia division. And so I got to see a, a plethora of things there because that covered a lot of part of the earth. <laughs> and then I migrated to the Middle East division. So it was the Levant area and that was around a time when ISIS was um, starting their, um, all of their things are in, you know, what was that, August of 2014 or 15? Um, and so then I started doing a lot of CJTF OIR support, um, Combined Joint Task Force Operation Inherent Resolve. 
and was helping with us because our president at the time was Obama and he said no boots on the ground. And so it was a fight from the air from drone strikes. So I was actively helping with that. And also I got involved with uh, Mosul Dam, which I am so, so proud of. So it is a earthen dam in Iraq that is on just poor soil around it. The geofix, ge the geology in the area is very poor. So it was a, um, after ISIS left the structure, because it was actually one of the first airstrikes for Operation Inherent Resolve. Um, so after ISIS was pushed out, um, there was a high probability of the dam was going to breach. And I got to be a part of that. I got to be a part of creating, helping create a new geo one capability that is still being used today. So if those colleagues are watching this, I am sorry. And um, <laughs> so it was an amazing time, an amazing experience. I spent a lot of time in the Middle East that year and helping in many ways fight terrorism. And uh, I still talk to a lot of those people now. I, I've never been active duty in the military, but I do understand when people talk about brothers and sisters in arms, I found that. And um, then I kind of migrated and was supporting as an image analyst, uh, some uh, Hezbollah issues in Lebanon and Syria. So um, yeah, some of the news and things that are happening now are, are very, close to my heart and uh, passion. And so that's been um, interesting following all the news on that happening right now. Um, so it's been, it's been a very curvy road. And then I ended up in the research directorate and working back on radar imagery and doing bi-statics, um, which is something that people don't really know about. I mean, even when I got first put on the project, I didn't know if it was a classified term or not. And it turns out it's in textbooks and, and you could go Google it. But I had no idea because I'd never heard of it before. Um, so most of most of this road is, you know, being safe behind a, a computer. Well, except when I did spend time in the Middle East. Um, and, you know, being being on just like I am talking with you, just looking at data and, and images. But, um, you know, we don't always use classified imagery. We also use commercial. And um, and so a lot of people think like the classified were also super cool because of enemy of the state, like you said. And, yeah. and it's like, oh, sometimes it's actually not, you know, super great. We have to use the same thing that you might if you go to you know, Google Maps and you look at, at Street View or something. You know, it's like sometimes we we have to use the same tools as well. The difference being, and I'll get, I've got some questions around this later. You know what you're looking at far better than I do when we look at the same image. Um, yeah. That's just given your skills, your background, your academic training, yeah. all getting training. put into practice. Yeah. And, and we will certainly get to that. So take us to 2019. You, you officially joined the UAP task force. And what I want you to answer around this for me and help me understand this. Was the UAP task force, when you join it, your only role and job there? Is that what you're being paid to do? Or is it a sidebar to your an active role you've got? <laughs> it was a sidebar. I it was, I would say, I forget what I said the other day. I think around 15% or something I was allowed to work during the week. I injected myself into the task force. I didn't let my deputy director accept no from me. I gave him like an argumentative essay right on the spot because he was asking one of my colleagues that was more senior than me to be on it. And he was like, I don't have time. Ask her, look at her. She's excited. She's ready. And and so um, that was definitely, I was 2019. I had just graduated from my master's program in countering weapons of mass destruction in July that, year, that summer. And I first I think I was officially on the task force. I want to say late that year. It might have been early in 2020. I forget the time frame. It might have been actually January 2020, but it was either December, you know, 2019 or, or, or January when I was officially on it. But I had already totally jumped in, you know, didn't care what the water was like or the current. I just did a cannonball right in before that. And I'm right in saying you found that task force role through working. It's like a SharePoint or chat room where you were basically involved. Can you talk on that first and then let's get into actually being involved in a task force and what that entailed? Yeah, absolutely. So at one point during that curvy roller coaster of a career I've had, I supported something that unfortunately is now ended, uh, but it was the joint collaboration cell. 
and it was based out of an NRO ground station. And it was a 24-7 support created by a person who unfortunately has passed away. But he was under attack in Afghanistan at one point and needed help. And he knew the intelligence community was out there to help. He knew there were 24-7 places. But every time he would try to reach out for help, no one knew how to do it or you know, comms were bad or bandwidth was bad. You couldn't download an image or something. And so he created this 24 seven operation cell to support whoever's out there who has access to the systems. And um, so with that came learning how to collaborate and learning skills of collaboration tools. So I had been using a lot of this collabor- these collaborative spaces for many years. And they're on many different systems, so you could access them um, whether you, you know, you're you're on you know boots on the ground somewhere and need help. You could call in somebody who might have access to a computer or something like that. But um, so these collaborative tools, you know, like the equivalent to your SharePoint site type thing and um, chat rooms. And so the chat rooms vary. And yeah, so I I first went to a chat room and was like, oh my gosh, I, I, I just read this report. I have this degree. And the report was, uh, I don't believe it was fresh because um, sometimes, you know, things come months later across your plate, right? Or maybe even sometimes years prior. And so I was reading a report about a nuclear missile site with these unidentified objects that were flying around it and interacting with something. And so I... So put me in. I have I have this astrophysics degree. I have this WMD degree. I am here to help, and so that's how I I jumped in. And we started um, first kind of getting to know each other. It was a lot of similar minded people. Of basically, it was just curiosity and knowing that um, it may or may not be from here. We didn't care. We just wanted to help. Now I'm. In my head, chat rooms to me take me back to 1999 and AOL. Okay, so, you know, ASL, do you yeah. have a webcam? Where are you from? Hi, you know, uh, sharing random stuff with, with strangers online. Um, mm. the, the internet was a very different place back then as it is now. Where is all this going? So you've got these random folks who all work for similar organizations and doing those kind of jobs like you do. So you're not talking to complete strangers in that sense. But if you've got files, for example, I'm guessing someone drops in a particular picture or video file of something unknown, and you all use your various expertise to try and work out what that is. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. And I, because of having that collaborative background, I also had a wide network of people I could ask of like, hey, do you know so-and-so that's in, I'm making this up, Cutter or something, and I'm probably saying that wrong. I'm from Missouri. Sorry, y'all. Um, but, you know, we might know somebody, oh, yeah, I know somebody at that base, or they might have had eyes on whatever, you know, the situation was. So I'm also the person that knows I'm not going to be the smartest in the room and that there's always somebody I could learn from. So I don't hesitate to say, I don't know this, but I know somebody who might, and I'll reach out to them. So it was kind of that similar manner of a lot of us had that same mentality that we would reach out to others and like, oh, I, you know what, I do know a person. And so, um, but that's also kind of what a task force is, right? It's a blend of all the things and all the people and diversity and you all work together and then come up with a, a solution. Um, so it was it was amazing to have, be a part of such collaboration. And I don't believe at well, before I was officially on the task force, I, the stuff that I was helping with, no one had that as their main day job either. We were all helping on the side. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Yeah, no, that's that's good. And to to what end and where is that information going? So if Sarah and John and Alan and Neil and Jenny all come together and work out something as prosaic or exotic, we'll call it for now, where does that go and what's getting done with it? Um, so well, that's a good question. We would kind of just chalk it up to, you know, okay, we've did 
X amount of time researching this. We've talked to people that might have, you know, seen it with our eyeballs or been an operator behind the camera or whatever, and um, came to a conclusion that let's say it's not um, identified. So being an unidentified or a UAP unidentified aerial phenomenon, it was uh, not necessarily meaning it was an NHI behind it. It was just, we didn't know how to un unidentify it. Mm. Oh my gosh. We didn't know how to identify it. And so deemed it as unidentified because of like, that could still be maybe an adversarial aircraft. So we would push it back saying, we don't know what's behind this. And then we, you know, report it up to our lead and he would do whatever he wanted with it. Did that work or role change Ugh. or how did it yeah, change? That was a lot of rambling. No, it was, it was totally fine. It was totally fine. Um, did that role then change or how did it change when you officially joined the task force for that year or was it much the same? It's much the same. Yeah. So uh, there were a few things that I started doing with the NGA leagues. I did. I want to remind people I supported the task force from a very narrow corner of um, the broader perspective of it. So I only looked at imagery or videos and was uh, very um, narrowly, I guess, you know, from a narrow perspective of it, because there is a much bigger, like I wasn't read into any, any special programs. And um, I I stuck to what I looked at and I was happy to be a part of the team on, on what I was able to see and the meetings I was a part of. Um, we were starting to do some uh, experiments. We were, I was, uh, yeah, coordinating to be, I don't know if I uh, leads the right word, but I was starting to coordinate with some other externals with NGA to try to prove or disprove of something that was happening. And then the COVID shutdown happened. So that all got derailed. Um, but yeah, so I would just report stuff to the lead and and he would take it from there. Just for a moment, I'm going to bring you forward about three years then to, to last July. Did you see the hearings when David Grush was speaking in front of Congress? And I wonder then, Absolutely. given what your role was and what David Grush was doing, and when this guy sits there and says, non-human biologics, crashed craft, ET, extra interdimensional, whatever the phrasing was, what's going through your head when you hear all that? Um, Pride. I mean, I, I was glued to watching. I was actually sitting at home on YouTube and was just so proud. He did such a great job. All the, all the men did. They did so wonderful. I was so proud and, um, you know, I wasn't surprised. I mean, I've always known my undergrad, I, you know, do an astrophysics. I've always known we're never alone. You know, there's infinite amount of space. Why, why can't there be thousands of civilizations out there? I mean, there's, we're so diverse here on earth. Why can't that be in space? So, I mean, I really wasn't surprised by it all, but I also have been a part of the community for a few years at that point um, at, from last summer. So I, I have met people and, and know some things by now. So I also knew it wasn't a surprise from what others had told me. How closely had you followed the UFO story? So working in the task force, working on the on the kind of chat room side of things beforehand, which I'm sure is completely underselling what it was to call it a chat room, but we'll call it a chat room for now. And then being on the task force, how close is Sarah Gam to the UFO story and what's happening outside of of work and professional life? Um, I actually really appreciate that question. So I kept it pretty segregated because I still had a passion for the UFO stuff, but I was behind a closed wall and a, a, a very thick brick wall. And so I kept things very um, separate. Mm. And then eventually that separateness whenever, because I, I do plan, you know, happy hours and gatherings and stuff. So a few of us would get together, the ones that we all lived near each other. Um, and things started kind of bleeding into my life. I mean, how could it not? I love it. I've loved X-Files my whole life. So um, when 
things started bleeding together, I still tried to keep things separate because there was a lot as the topic grew and more, you know, era OD and I released a paper, then Arrow released some papers. Um, more people got curious and would join chat rooms. And so it got more difficult to have that passion because just as some people will be commenting on this that aren't kind, um, I had that in the classified space as well. So uh, that passion started kind of fizzling a little bit off and on over the past few years because people are people are genuinely um, curious, but also they're starting to treat what they're typing in words on a comment on something as the person that might read it doesn't have feelings or a soul. And so it, things have things have been segregated for a bit again at one point. And um, so I stopped reading a lot of UFO type books and I stopped reading uh, into a lot of things. And then somehow that's when James Fox found me and asked me to be in his film. So <laughs> I guess all my, all my thoughts of stopping and ending um, didn't quite work out. The universe had other plans. <laughs> And we will come back to that, the, the James Fox stuff okay. as well. We'll try and keep it to some kind of timeline as best I can. And when you talk about the trolls and the bad comments, I had my worst one a few days ago, Sarah, ever in four and a half years ago of doing this show where someone commented they found I was hard to take serious because I wore a hoodie and that I had bad hair. And the hair comment was the most offensive, Sarah, I've ever had anyone say to me online. They can call me names and stuff. That never bothers me. But I thought my hair looked okay. So um, if, the, if they're watching, thanks, Sarah, and yours. So if you're watching or you listening to warned me. I wouldn't have put my face on or done anything. <laughs> we could have, you know. <laughs> you, listen, you're going to get all the abuse under the sun. But hey-ho, welcome mm -hmm. to the UFO world. And like you said to me previously, you're thick-skinned and... Not that it excuses mm -hmm. it, but that this is life. And it's interesting you say you found it was a similar tone for folks in the chat rooms. And would that be across the task force work as well, that you had people who were really passionate and interested in UFOs, maybe from childhood or, or through experiences, to folks who were involved but really wanted to prove this was nonsense or look down on it? Was that the case? Um, task force days... I didn't really get a lot of blowback from people. And if I did, I would start, you know, making light of the situation, talking about X-Files. And, um, but I also, I knew how to approach that. I've worked at NGA for a long time. So if I wanted to ta work with, um, so we have a directorate that will task the, the images. And so I would work with them and, I knew a lot of them already. So they knew who I was. They knew I was serious. They knew I was usually fighting terrorists. And um, so I wouldn't come to them with just fluff or waste their time. So I already had a good established relationship with a lot of the people that I worked with. Um, a few that did end up being like, you serious? And I'm like, well, Mulder sister's still out there. So I would, I would end up making jokes, but I never really got much pushback until it became a more popular topic and more people started getting, and it wasn't even pushback. It was, um, we had certain rules that we needed to follow. It's, it's a government monitored system. And um, so there were some major rules that were starting to be unfollowed, not followed and broken and you know, unauthorized disclosure started happening more frequently. And um, it was just, uh, it was very disheartening to go through some things that I did um, and not just me, others as well. So there was a few of us um, that were trying to keep people in check to make sure no, you know, laws were being violated for being on a government monitored system. Um, and they didn't like that. I'm going to caveat the next set of questions, Sarah, with um, mentioning to folks, you have a security clearance, don't you? Yes, I do. Okay. So uh, there's going to be some questions here that I've done my very best to get as much of an answer from you as possible, because this is the inevitable bit yes. where Sarah says, I can't discuss that potentially, but let's, let's see where we can go. So I wonder, Sarah, right. you're deep breath. You're, I'm ready. Yeah. Big breath. You've, you're, you've got the, the chat room, uh, you've got videos and imagery being shared. I'm sure data within there as well. 
you've got your time in the task force. Do you remember maybe the first time you had some data, be it, you know, numbers on a sheet of paper, which a geek like you would love, you know, someone like myself wouldn't understand, but you're a self-professed geek or a picture or a video that you really had to sit back and go, wow, wait a minute, this is something a bit different. Do you remember that moment? And um, maybe I'm yeah, not asking you to talk about what yes. it was, but what was it like? Um, it was disbelief and uh, kind of takes your breath away. I mean, I've seen what I thought was a UFO in person and you just stare at it and you're like, is that, did I? No. And, you know, there, my, my first thought isn't to get my cell phone out to take a video of what I'm seeing. It's to breathe. And that was kind of a, a similar moment of, um, okay, rewind. I need to watch this again. Okay. Yep. Hey, yep. Hit play and, and pause and zoom in and my brain's playing tricks on me. No, that has to be a balloon and, and start second guessing and going through the Rolodex in my brain of what else it could be. And watching it again and then chatting with another person, you know, my, my colleague who was very science-based. And um, so I'm like, um, can you just take a quick gander at this? I don't, uh, I just want to make sure before I, I say something to somebody else and he'd take a look and be like, what was that? I'm like, okay, that's all I needed. <laughs> and um, yeah, it was a very memorable experience. I'm going to say my first reaction was, to, to remind myself to breathe again, because it's just, you know, a moment that catches your breath and, um, and then rewatch it and rewatch it again, and then send it to somebody else and read, read up on who I could reach out to who might've submitted it or, or whatever. So safe to say then it's a video. Um, and is it, yeah. is it, <laughs> yeah. Is that video out in the public domain? No. Okay. Um, the rest of that day, how does that affect you? Because I think this is something that most folks can't appreciate. I probably don't either. But when someone works doing the job you do, or a David Grush, or a Lou Elizondo, or any other countless number of folks involved in the kind of work we're talking about here, essentially looking at UFO data, I don't think they maybe realize that at the end of the day, they clock out, they finish their shift, and they have to go home. So that day you'll have you'll have traveled home and you'll have sat down and you'll have put the TV on. Is that not a world changing moment to to really have that sort of information in your head now? I've never thought of that. I think um, because of my spiritual world, some of this isn't a surprise. So when I go home, it's like maybe I just need to meditate and sit sit with myself in some silence for a little bit, but. Uh, yeah, I don't I don't recall going home and having this momentous momentous moment because being a spiritual person and, and seeing the other side that I guess maybe it just wasn't that big of a, a surprise to me because I've always known we weren't alone. But I do remember driving home and being like, I wish I could call somebody. This is so cool. And and of course, not being able to. <laughs> so, um, yeah, meditation it was. That's fair enough. Do you not get friends asking at parties after a few drinks, Sarah, what have you seen? What's it like? And um, Definitely. I think sometimes uh, they get more curious. Uh, a few people might, but they also know that I can't talk about my work. And so uh, they don't want to risk me going to jail. And um, they, they know I likely won't survive. Um, but yeah, friends do get curious and I do share what I can or I might um you know share with them some of my spiritual stuff if we if we get curious enough, but not everybody likes to hear that either. So um yeah, they get curious, but they also respect my boundaries. There's definitely some questions that I won't waste your time asking because I know what's going to come back with you know, you can't discuss. And there are various reasons people like Sarah can't discuss, including locations, quality of video, um, the sensor systems being used, stuff like that. And that's just because I've had multiple guests on in the past, like Lou Elizondo, you know, people like that who, who can't discuss that kind of information. So, um, but you have said that you've seen a lot of, of bloody data 
that we see in the public, you know, blobs and lo pixelated videos and such. Yeah. Is it fair to say that when you view those blurry videos and images that you know exactly what other sensor systems either would be useful to look at with them? So in my head, I'm thinking Tic Tac, Gimbal, Go Fast. Mm -hmm. So those are the right. three, I'm going to call them boring videos, Sarah, because I feel they're boring and prosaic enough they were allowed to be released and it seems at this point we know there is extended footage of at least some of them which show some more interesting things like maneuverability maybe clarity acceleration stuff like that that we're not allowed to see because i think even that would make the public go oh but right now those three videos are out there and the public largely haven't sat up and took notice so when you're watching Tic Tac, Gimbal, Go Fast, are all three of those videos for you and what you know and your expertise enough to think these are something completely exotic or do you still think either of the three could be prosaic? Um, I mean, I trust what's been done before. So I don't like to duplicate effort and to reanalyze because that work was done and it was good work and a lot of good work was put forth to get it declassified and released to the public. So I don't like looking at something like that all again and again, but yes, there's, there's more data that shows uh, we're not alone to, in my opinion, of course, and, and a few others, but um, I do get, I guess a lot of comments about how people can't believe I haven't, you know, talked more about those, but those have already been talked about. To me, it's like, let's move on to the fresh stuff and, and let's move on towards disclosure instead of talking about these. They're incredible. So I'm not downplaying what they are. They are incredible, but they work has been done on them. Taxpayer dollars have been paid. And um, yeah. I'll give an example for you on that, why some of this stuff isn't released. And as I'm not a US citizen, but just purely from a UFO conversation, I'd love to see all this stuff released and to hell with national security. But that's not how the real world works. Now, I've heard there is a video which uh, was filmed by like US military, whatever it may have been, at quite a distance, a pretty spectacular distance from a Russian ship and in observing this ship, they filmed multiple UAP. Now, they weren't meant to be where they were. And I think everyone knows at this point, Russia, US, China, every country spies on each other. That's just, you know, that's that's not a secret. But these UAP were filmed by coincidence. So that footage is meant to be spectacular. But you can't release it, if, even if you wanted to, if you were the US, because then it shows you've been spying on Russia. So there are things like that. And I'm not going to ask Sarah to, to even follow up on that because she couldn't if she wanted to. But that kind of stuff, and that I talked about that with Jeremy Corbell, if anyone wants to go back, are sort of some of the reasons that this stuff can't be shown. But I'm guessing would be the type of thing that Sarah you have potentially seen within your work at the task force. Is that in the ballpark? Yes. That's fair. What what sort of percentage of material and data do you look at that you would say, without doubt, is truly anomalous slash exotic slash NHI? Now, that's not to say I'm sure you've seen some videos, Sarah, where there are objects maneuvering pretty incredibly with weird shapes and sizes, but they are Chinese, Russian, US, etc. Really, really high tech gadgetry. What percentage of stuff do you see that you would say is truly, you know, the good stuff that we would like to know about? Um, I'd say it is a small percentage because there are a lot of balloons out there and and other objects that make it seem it's unidentified and the data quality is isn't the best. Um, man, I would say I can. Uh, I've tried to put a percentage on this before and I it's really hard because it, it is more of a letdown than anything because it can be described or especially like weather balloons are looking crazier and crazier now and they're up in the air longer. So um, less than 10. I'm, I'm trying. Oh, yeah, I was going to say 5%. Okay. 
I think I've gone five percent before in the past, and from a place of pure no knowledge, just speculation, I would imagine a lot of this stuff that gets posted online or is seen are mis misidentifications or adverse adversarial tech. And mm -hmm. I think those shutdowns from February twenty twenty three showed us that these balloons are, that are being used. I think it was a Chinese balloon at one point. That's really what you would presume is low tech from what you would expect in 2023 but it seemed to be pretty effective because it seems it had been there and was undetected and i'm guessing that kind of stuff's been going on so um one thing i would be interested in, in knowing as best you can is what sort of spread do you see or have you seen with the data that objects are either water-based air-based or above the atmosphere good question um i will say from i think it's probably because of the data i was looking at i didn't observe a lot of water stuff so i i mean water was even a smaller percentage of that i would say there was only like you know one maybe two videos that ended up being something unidentified from water um, but I wasn't an expert at marine things. And yeah. so it was not my forte, um, especially looking at SAR imagery. SAR imagery doesn't do the best over, over water and, and especially massive water. Um, That's fair. Areas. So, um, yeah, a lot of, a lot of the other things that you asked, I would say definitely a smaller percentage, but you know, most of what I looked at was, um, land based. So I was looking at terrain and, um, or maybe clouds or yeah so that would indicate stuff clouds would be stuff higher up in the air but is being caught by imagery mm -hmm. as we think yes. um space-based stuff must be mega sensitive um just because of i'm guessing the quality of technology and whatnot that may be in in the air and we know there are thousands of satellites um elon musk seems to be throwing them into space like they're toys at the minute to him um but i wonder and this will be a hard one for you to talk on i'm presuming but I, as best you can and hopefully the question makes sense are there differences that you could tell or see from any captured imagery data or video that would stand out you would see because it was space-based capture as opposed to it being in the air or underwater there were maybe particular traits that you didn't see when something was in the air um i would be able to see depending on the sensor so i'm going to try to answer this best i can without um uh yeah so Going to jail. Yeah. when <laughs> thank you when you you look at something from a different sensor it also is a different perspective, right? So physics is about when you solve a problem and you solve a problem from a different perspective, you get a completely different answer. So that's the same thing with your camera angle, right? You get a different sun glint off of, of, off of an object. Um, so infrared is typically less resolution, but you get a sun angle or you get a heat signature somewhere different than you would in something else. So um, each, uh, item uh, each sensor that i was able to look at definitely provided a different layer of validation um sometimes it you know depending on the sensor it's easier to tell if something's a balloon or not um like one of my jobs over the years uh because everybody i'm very open that i'm a part of the uap community when i start a job is i don't want the stigma or you know i'm i'm very open about it and so you know my office will quickly know that uh, to come to me if they find anything or if, you know, oh, my, you know, you know, I was out hiking the other night and I saw something, I took a video, can you look at it? So everybody knows that I'm happy to, to talk to them about all this stuff. So one day I came back from a vacation and they were like, oh my gosh, we, we have, we, we captured a UAP and I look at it and the whole office for days thought, that this was a UAP, they were certain. And I took a look at it for half a second and I was like, that's a balloon. So I totally bursted their bubble and I felt bad because I, I don't like telling somebody when they think they really captured something, but you know, I'm going to look at what the data is and that was a balloon. I'm like, okay, look at the sun angle and it's glinting and, and look at it moving, it's moving along the wind path. And um, 
So yes, it's depending on the sensor, you definitely get different uh, a perspective on what you're looking at. I'm presuming there's not many balloons in space. What would be some of the misidentifications and and outside the atmosphere? Um, the misidentification is because so you have you have an object higher and you know then and looking at an object lower. So you also have Earth's rotation. So things might be out of sync a little bit. So that that becomes like a little bit of parallax, right? So um, things are moving at a different speed or a different direction than what you think you are because your sensor and the object and then Earth are all moving at different um, times and, and different velocities. So um, the 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 movement, so the movement and even the sun. So the sun might be over here or might be back here where this crazy cat is and um, so with the object moves and then the satellite moving, you got all kinds of different physics happening, right? Um, so the sun angle might glint at something, maybe the payload on a balloon a little bit differently. Um, I hope I answered that properly. Yeah. Um, I wonder, have you ever, and this would probably, I'm guessing, be something you would do personally rather than professionally. Have you seen any of the, the kind of NASA shuttle videos on YouTube that are there for everyone to see that show all kinds of weird and wonderful things floating about, which I would presume most of that would be indeed ice crystals, bits of stuff breaking off. But do you ever watch any of those or have seen any of those and think that's pretty interesting? Oh, absolutely. For sure. And I also find it interesting that once in a while, the feeds just magically cut off and goes to something else. <laughs> is, is that not just a technical thing, though, Sarah? Let's not be starting conspiracies now. I, is it? I, yeah, I, I don't know. I am not an operator. I, I'm not at NASA, so I'm not going to speak or judge for them. But yeah. <laughs> very, very curious at how a feed might get cut off when somebody goes, what's that? I'll even be fair on that one. It, it would be very easy for me to go down the full conspiracy route. I don't doubt that now and again, US, Russian, Chinese tech, shall we say, comes into view of space stations or what that, whatever that may be and isn't meant to be there. But it seems very clear that there are times something else comes into view. Um, I think the tether incident is probably one of the most famous ones on the NASA footage. Um, where there is like a clear size and measurement to this pole and there seems to be space. things mm -hmm. going around. Is that, did you see stuff like that within the task force? And I'm not I'm even going to say that, but stuff like um, that. I will, I, I don't know how to answer that. So yes and no, because like my science brain, my analytical brain is trying to be, um, subjective I, or not subjective. Um, I'm overthinking it. So I'm going to say yes and no. Sorry. Should I be more direct then in the question? Like, would you see videos? I can't even ask that, can I? Because that's not going to be. What What would you like to say around that that you can? Um, you know, About like the, the NASA video? Just NASA that, that, sort of, that sort of video being what you would be able to look at within your professional capacity or have it passed to you to say, have a look at this and tell us, is this something worth digging into further? Um, well, what I say always when somebody will send me like a snippet of something is, well, is it longer? Do I have more data? Where were you located? Well, where was the light source? If it was nighttime, was there a street light nearby? Is it, uh, you know, a sun flare type thing in your your camera. So I would ask a lot of questions before jumping to a conclusion. Um, I always like the initial, oh, that looks so crazy. Okay, but but where are you looking and, and what time of day is it? And um, yeah, we're, I just like, I, I've talked about birds um, a few times in a few of my interviews, like what kind of season is it? Is it geese flying over? And, yeah. Um, so I would ask for more data before I would really jump to a conclusion. Very fair. And I think it's good to hear that happens because there's nothing, debunking shouldn't be a bad or dirty word people hear, you know. It's just mm -hmm. finding out the really good stuff from the wheat from the chaff, you know. And that's something that I think can be missing at times in the UFO topic. Yes. Now, um, 
many folks are coming out now, Sarah, and saying things like zero doubt or no doubt these objects are not human. I think you yourself have said that on, on multiple interviews in your opinion. Um, what are you seeing exactly or have you seen within the confides you can speak of in a professional capacity that has taken you to that determination that some of these objects categorically are not human? So what's brought me to the conclusion, just say we're not alone? Yeah, is it um, a couple of particular things or observables, or is it just a multitude? Yeah, I, I mean, I, it's always a, a knowing because of you know I mentioned my my undergrad and knowing that this is infinite amount of space. We, it's impossible for us to be alone. Um, and then seeing multiple things, and then doing a lot of research, like a couple of projects that. I have been a part of, we would look into so much data and talk, you know, so not me, I didn't talk to him, but somebody would reach out and find like a drone operator that might have been working behind uh, the, the computer that day that saw something. And we've done a lot of research and it boiled down to, you know, three months of research type thing and many people a part of the project. And it comes down to, we don't know what this is. We're all scratching our heads. We're like, I don't, I, I don't know. And so by being a part of multiple projects like that and my background in, you know, the astrophysics world and now, of course, my spiritual world, um, I, I just, it, it surprises me that some people do think that we are alone. It gets literally infinite amount of space we don't know the end to space itself um how can we be the only ones here so given you still work for the bad guys quote unquote you know the the government the shadowy cabals which are covering this up and the government's a, a joke the government's a massive entity of offices and buildings and and people who do all kind of jobs from the bottom up you know it's it's difficult to say the government's covering this up but at this point What's the best way to say this? Why do you feel, or did you get an impression from the folks you were working with, there is there is a reason this is being kept secret and undercover, taking aside the, the national security stuff and the sensitive sensors and whatnot? Mm -hmm. You believe, Carl Nell believes, you know, uh, David Grush believes, Lou Elizondo, and many, many others, unequivocally, we are not alone. There is a non-human intelligence either here or visiting here or whatever it may be. Why can't the government at least come out and tell people that or why aren't they, in your opinion? Yeah, my opinion, definitely, definitely my opinion. I like stressing that. I, I really think we just buried ourselves because initially... You know, I understand why it might have been a secret. And this is, it was, you know, 40s were not an easy time to be on earth with war. And so I get wanting to keep something so profound a secret. And I really, I do believe it just got buried so deep. And some of those people passed away. So they couldn't pass on their knowledge because they weren't allowed to talk about it. And um, now, it's pretty amazing to see how far we've come just since 2017, since the New York Times article came out of the stigma going down. I mean, we have commercial airline pilots taking videos and reporting them and posting them and more, more military reporting things as well. It's so amazing to see the change and not just since, since 2017, just in the past couple of years. Um, more people are looking up and that makes that makes my giant heart even more happy that folks are looking up because uh, I mean one the sky is beautiful but um yeah it's it's just more of another layer of we're not alone and just to, to keep the open mind and um I don't know where this went to I'm sorry no, no, that that's fine. I, I'm going to take you back then, bring you back a couple of years to yeah. your your time with the task force ending officially. Now, am I correct in saying it did still carry on unofficially? You were still helping out. And what sort of happened yeah. that it ended and, and carried on in that unofficial way? Yeah, I got a new job. So I got a job at ODNI, Office of Director of National Intelligence. And so um, you... 
my official capacity on the task force did definitely end, but it was also a part of like the COVID shutdown and folks weren't responding to emails because I, you know, some people might not have been back in the office. And um, so a lot of things just ended up fizzling out on my end, mostly honestly, because of the COVID shutdown and I got a new job during it basically. So um, yeah. And then I just was able to support on the sidelines a little bit. And how did the formation of Arrow, so the Alternate Domain Anomaly Resolution Office, change even the unofficial working for you? And and how did you see its whole existence? Um, when I first started, it was weird. Um, they didn't really talk to people from the task force. We offered data. They said we have our own database. We we tried working with them, um, you know, looking at some of the papers that they were putting out and didn't take feedback. Um, so it was it was, uh, weird is a good way to describe it, maybe a nice way to describe it. Yeah. Um, so a lot of a lot of turmoil started with distrust and stuff because we weren't they weren't working with prior people or legacy programs, but I was just one person, right? So they might've been working with somebody else. Um, I did hear very similar things from others though, um, including people much higher than me that were on the task force. I, it was very disheartening and um, I was still hopeful. I think I'm always a hopeful person. That's how I was raised and that's who I am. So I was always hopeful that they were um, doing their thing behind the scenes, behind those brick, brick walls that they formed. Um, and yeah, I think, I think now over time, the, you know, there's a new director there and, um, with new leadership comes a change and every, every new leader has a way of leading and, and operating their office. So, um, I'm excited to see what's to come. I think for many people, Ada was now operating from such a low bar that they could no longer disappoint and they could only keep expectations uh, as low as they are. You can't keep or, my laughing. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, but, but, it, but it's true, isn't it? They've been so, yes. so disappointing. Yes. I suppose unless you are, yeah. well, I'm not going to start, talk conspiracy, but a lot of folks would believe that they've been put there to do a, a Project Blue Book 2.0 Susan Goff and folks at the Pentagon want this shut down and Arrow was a good way to do it. So maybe they think Kirkpatrick and others did a good job. Maybe they didn't. Who knows? But that's the way some folks think. But like you say, no director. Let's see what happens. If indeed it does go anywhere. But there seems to be a lot of a lot of progress outside of that, which we'll definitely get to. Um, and just to touch on what is it you're actually doing now? Your role is not related to UAP anymore, is it? <laughs> Not at all. I'm a nuclear analyst in the Pentagon. Oh, that sounds so boring. Um, yeah, we'll move on from that. Um, <laughs> but listen, um, what I want to do before we, and this is probably a good point to say, we'll start wrapping up what's going to be part one, because I definitely think before we get to listener questions, we're going to shift the conversation. You've mentioned your spirituality a few times, and we've got a conversation that will probably have a shift in tone but certainly is not unrelated to the UFO topic, folks. So um, just to touch on your own sighting to wrap up this kind of part one, Sarah, do you want to touch on that? You mentioned it earlier, and it was only just in the last 12 months, I believe. Is that right? Of what? Your own sighting in the last kind of year. Oh, yes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, that was la um, uh, that would have been June. I think, or maybe, no, I think it was June of 2023. So June of last summer. And just talk us through exactly kind of what happened. It wasn't just you, was it? And it was the Brown Hill Mountains? Yeah. Oh, Brown Mountain Lights. Ooh, you were Brown. so close. Good job. Brown Mountain Lights in Linville Gorge in North Carolina. And it is a very well known. So anybody could go out there and search what Brown Mountain Lights are and lots of things will come up. So a handful of us, including some of my family members, we went out one night to go UFO hunting. And how cool is my life? Uh, I was I was loving going UFO hunting and um, being in this beautiful, beautiful area. It's so gorgeous there. Um, and then 
So we're all like some people have equipment, they have, you know, night vision and all kinds of really cool stuff. And, uh, you know, maybe some some whiskey was being passed around as well to keep warm because it got a little chilly. Um, and one of the guys, a stranger that was there, because there was a couple of other strangers, um, other people doing the same thing, having the same idea that we did because it is a popular area. Um the there was one of the strangers and I we had just met and we were talking with somebody else that I had also just met that day and we were facing her like I'm facing the camera and let's say like just above the camera is where she was sitting and a light popped up and we had seen like these lights pop up and we all got excited and it turned out to be you know the flight pattern of of the airport nearby or it was hikers and you could see their their headlamps um, or maybe even they, they started a fire or something. So there was a lot of letdowns in the evening. And then this light popped up just above the head of the woman that we were chatting with. And I look at him and he has this like very calm presence. And of course we just met, he's a total stranger. And I'm like trying not to freak out. I'm like, is that, is, th is that, and I don't want to blink because I don't know if it'll go away. I don't know what it'll do. And I, you know, remind myself to breathe, um, but it popped up above one of the um, mountain crests and kind of hovered and then did a little wiggly do thing. And I'm like, that's, that's weird. That's definitely not an aircraft. Uh, that's not, that's not a holding pattern type, you know, a situation for an aircraft. And so it went away. It just disappeared. And I'm looking at the guy. And of course, the woman has no idea that we're witnessing this because it's nighttime. It's hard to see each other. And so she's still talking, not having a clue. We're having an experience. And all of a sudden, the light comes back. And it's just a little bit higher than where it was before. And um, yeah, so I it went away very quickly at that point. And it wasn't a flare. It's not like, you know, it was you know, again, the Rolodex is clicking on definitely not a balloon, definitely not this. And, and so I just kind of like appreciated the moment, like I just saw something and I looked down at the rest of the crew because they were like down a little bit from where I was and everybody's looking in the opposite direction. And so I was the only one of all of us that evening that ended up seeing that. So that was, that was pretty cool, but I definitely understand when people see something and you know, folks are like, why didn't you take a picture? And I'm like, I, there was that was not a thought. Plus, it was nighttime, so that likely wouldn't have come out in a video, anyways, on my cell phone. Um, yeah, it was pretty cool. You probably would have needed one of those very special sensors that you were working yeah. with a few years before yeah. uh, that you were familiar with, yeah, to get anything yeah. from that. Um, but listen, Sarah, I appreciate you sharing that because your own experience is your own experience, and not everyone is always comfortable doing so. Um, so we'll call that the end of part one because part two is going to change tone, isn't it? Um, I like that. All right, let me take a drink of water. There, I'm ready. Do you need a break before we get there? Or are you Are you good? Um, no, I think I'm good. I just, any, if anything, I'd need more water, but I think I'm good. No, that's fine. Awesome. Cool. Well, let's go straight into it. And on News Nation with Ross Coulthard, um, which, by the way, given what you talk about and what we are going to talk about, if you read the YouTube comments, it's surprisingly positive given the nature of what you you end up discussing. Uh, and I was really pleasantly surprised to see that because of the way YouTube can be. Hi to everyone watching on YouTube. Um, and something you said to Ross was, I don't know how crazy you want this to get. Um, so I'm going to say to you, Sarah, let's get as crazy as you want to and discuss the the okay. woo, the spiritual, the spirituality, whatever you want to call it. Um and I was trying to think of a good place to start this conversation. And I was going to go with 2012. You had a near-death experience. Would that be the best place to start? Um, sure. Yeah. Uh, things started increasing more then. I did have uh, May 10th of 2012. I remember the date. I remember numbers very easily. Probably why I got a physics degree. Um, and... Things started increasing after that. So most of my life I have had spiritual or ghost encounters or I've had vivid dreams of loved ones that would come to me. And then after my near death experience, I started having more psychic things happen, which I really didn't understand at the time and was freaking me out. 
And that progressed to more of the vivid dreams. And also, I don't think I talked about it before. I would have kind of like the movie, The Sixth Sense, the things would visit the little boy, especially in his sleep. And he, and that would happen with me. And I didn't know what was happening. So a good chunk of my life, I had suffered from night terrors every once in a while. And, but I would know I would be in the night terror and I would scream at um, my boyfriend at the time to wake me up in my sleep. And, um, and so I had no idea that it was like from the spiritual aspect of things until I started going down to like training and, and learning how to you know protect myself. Um, but yeah, I started having more an onslaught of things and that included visitors in my dreams in, in the house where I was certain a guy in a raincoat in a rainstorm was in my bedroom and um, it would, I would talk to him, like these entities in my sleep. So I would be sitting up asleep, talking to them. And my ex would, you know, case the house to make sure we were alone. It would freak him out enough. Cause I was that convincing that something was in the room. So sometimes I would just point to him, like, he's right there. You don't see him. And then of course he'd come back to bed with adrenaline high. And I'm like laying back down, I'm laying down and back to sound asleep. Cause I was asleep the whole time but I would remember all of this. And um, so like more things started happening like that and, and more psychic things and things progressed to um, having somebody else's loved one come to me. And I, the person that she was a part of, like the living person, um, him and I didn't know each other very well. And it freaked me out horribly bad. I didn't know what was happening to me. I was predicting some of these things for myself that were, you know, occurring. And I, that was the last straw. I was like, I'm going crazy. I don't understand what's going on. I need help. And so that's kind of how my classes and all my training start, journey started was thinking I was um, super cray cray and needed help. And, and you, you mentioned to me, a lot of folks have reached out to you because you've touched on some of those experiences in previous interviews and folk have wanted you to follow that up. So take me through a timeline wise. Are we, is that 2012, 2013 or are we going back further yeah. than that so no, far? No, it's actually forward in time from where you're talking about. Um, this would be 2018. I had actually, uh, the person and I were, his loved one came to me and I'm freaky. I'm freaked out. Um, he, we stopped talking soon after that. And, uh, I found a psychic medium and that wasn't too far from me. I have loved ghost stuff, you know, my entire life. And so as I was reaching out to find a psychic medium, which I had never done before, um, I didn't know what to look for. And I just knew that there's a lot of people, a lot of scams out there, a lot of, a, a lot of, um, you know, like I'll call it like Miss Cleo, like you see Miss, I'm not saying Miss Cleo was a scam, but like the commercials and stuff of, of Miss Cleo back in the day of, of call Miss Cleo, I'll, I'll help. And, and so I was, didn't know what I was looking for. And I of course found the right person, but she was about I don't know, not far, less than half an hour away from my house. So made an appointment with her. She was booked up for pretty far in advance. So I had to wait, I think it was probably about a month or so before I was able to finally go talk with her. And I was super nervous. I actually, this is really funny. I briefed a four-star general. I briefed the director of NSA that day, National Security Agency. And so I briefed a four-star general and left work right after the briefing to go to my psychic medium appointment. And can I just, I I'm going to interrupt you, Sarah, and I'm yeah. really sorry because I want you to keep your flow going, but yeah. I think this is a really important thing in the UFO conversation, sort of where we're at now. So people for years, decades have wanted individuals like David Grush Sarah Gam and others to come forward and we'll, we'll lump Lou Elizondo and all those names I just don't want to rhyme off everyone's name every time and talk about the UFO subject and talk about analyzing real pictures of UFO talk about seeing but non-human biologics and all the stuff that for decades was literally consigned to movies 
and it's a strange thing where we are in society that now we're there and we've got these individuals like yourself coming forward it's kind of blown people's minds a little bit that it's it's not the narrative they maybe had in their head and the best way i can put this and sorry i've used this one before folks is when when i read the harry potter books i in my head had this whole world created this is what the school looked like this is what the characters looked like hermione for three years i called hermione because i didn't know her name as hermione no social media you know it was the 90s so mm -hmm. and then yeah. when you see it on a screen and it's a director's interpretation and here's the cast and here's the the language and it can change it can be good it can be bad it can be better all different things and i think this is where people have had all of a sudden for many folks the ufo topic for years maybe have been slightly more entertainment than informative and now it's such a real thing that you can attribute and attach real people to this story and i think you make a great point there like you say you were literally doing a briefing with a four-star general for the nsa one afternoon and then at night forget what you're even doing you're just off living your life and that's the point of, i've asked people like louise elizondo the day you saw that piece of footage what was it like driving home in your car afterwards sitting in traffic looking at the family in the car next to you having a meltdown because their kids are kicking off in the back seat and you've got this paradigm world changing video playing over and over and over in your head you know david grush having journalists go after and attack his private life which he has a private life. He has a personal life that's nothing to do with his job, with his role. And it's kind of brought to the forefront. And people can see that as muddying the UFO conversation. But it's just people's lives and real lives. So I just want to make that point that it's it's great. You're sharing the real... You, ha, you are a real person. You have a life and interests that just because it doesn't necessarily conform with someone listening or watching this is view of what someone working in this topic or the intelligence community should be like because that's not what the movie said doesn't mean it's not real and true and genuine so i am now rambling so sorry to put you off no thank you um yeah and it was a career goal of mine to brief a four-star general one day because i got to brief a lot of three stars while i was at nga and so i thought oh you know what let's up the ante let's brief a four and I had no idea I'd be able to do that <laughs> at such an early, like I have so much of my career left. And um, so that was really cool, you know, put in, putting a different hat on and going to a completely different experience. Like I said, I'd never had a psychic medium reading before, but I was um, freaking out. So when you asked earlier about, you know, after you see these videos of, um, you know, potential UAPs, how do you go home and you sit and you're in traffic? I've had a lot of the moments where I've been blown away by more spiritual stuff where I'm like, oh my gosh, that was real. That was me. That was, uh, I don't know how to process this. And I can't just like call anybody about it because this was in my brain and this was my experience. It's not theirs. Cause I don't want to project this on other people. It's their, their life. It's not. So, um, yeah, anyway, so I go to my reading and, um, woman was absolutely wonderful and she told me things that i had a best friend that had passed away the year prior and she said details that no one would have known and gave me healing that i will i'm forever grateful for and then she also you know we, we talked about lo other loved ones and and some other very private things that no one would have ever have known and then she said, you could be in my seat. I'm like, what are you talking about? And she said, they're showing me you in my seat. Like you have the gifts, you have the abilities. You just need to know how to bring it out in you and, and know the training or get some training to know how to bring it out. I was like, I'm in. Like, you don't have to say anymore. I'm in. How do I do this? I'm in grad school. I was in grad school at the time. It was like, I... I have to finish grad school. <laughs> I have no capacity. I'm working full time and I'm in grad school. And uh, I was like, I barely am sleeping right as it now as it is. So um, I, can we put a pen in this? And so she, of course, was like, yeah, um, I do teach. 
I have like a, a spiritual school here. And it's like, yeah, I'm in. I just, we have to put a pin in this. And um, so I ended up going to her after my classes, after my, my grad school was over. And yeah, started my training. And it just so happened a few months after I graduated, um, she was starting like a new session of like the round one, basically, you know, spirit 101 kind of. Um, yeah, so all the, all the timing, everything ended up working out, of course, perfectly as it is. Um, so that was really how I started diving in was, um, I'll, yeah, I still even, I remember what I wore that day, briefing the general and then going to her. So <laughs> very memorable. No, thanks for that. And you're saying year-wise we're around 2017, 18, is that right? 18, yes. So are we in the end of 18? Are we in AOL chat room territory here? Is it um are you in the chat room with the unofficially with the UAP folks at this point? Um no, not yet. I didn't join that until 2019. Okay. So how did and obviously you're gonna you're gonna be doing that. You'll be down the road with your 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 learning, your spiritual journey and your mediumship. Did that conversation ever bleed into conversations with the folks in the chat rooms or even within the task force? And I wonder how that landed if it did. I bit my tongue a lot. Because <laughs> <laughs> um, sometimes we would go down rabbit holes and, you know, yeah, once in a while we'd go down rabbit holes talking about um, aliens and the crossover of spirituality and ghosts and and so I, I really bit my tongue and I, and I bit my tongue enough to where it's like, no, I'm in here. This, I'm, I'm, this is being discussed for a reason. I can provide value. I can pro provide input. So I very slowly started saying things like, oh, I've been watching ghost shows my whole life. I know all about this. So I would, I would make it like a fun cover for what I was doing. Cause I was afraid. I was afraid I would get fired. I was afraid I would, um, my career would be over and, my clearance pulled. So very, very scared to fully be like, I'm going to be a psychic medium one day. Cause I was still in the classes. Right. And, uh, so eventually I, I forget what day it was, but I finally told a few people privately and they were like, that's really cool. Like, how do you, uh, and they, they ended up asking a bunch of questions about how I came about it and um, also being a scientist. And it was really neat that it was like a, a caring and a non-judgment situation instead of being judged and told to leave the room or, or whatever. So it ended up being a very positive experience. Like, and then I would slowly start not filtering as much to others and uh, be more open about it. And the more I was open about it, I realized no one cared and it was quite freeing. And I, we used to call it coming out. So a handful of my friends still haven't, you know, come out and because their family might not um, uh, appreciate it. So some of my classmates that I was with in the spiritual training courses they um like some of their family members don't see the value in what we were doing or whatever they don't feel comfortable talking about it with others and so i felt really blessed that i was surrounded completely surrounded by people that accepted me and i you know i'm still the same person i'm still like quirky and nerdy and um now i just have more weird jokes i could share with others <laughs> And do you know what? You've not actually talked about the the near death experience yet, because I think that's that's really important, and it seems to come up in conversations. And well, this isn't a near death experience or ghost podcast. This is all relevant to to what we're talking about. When I spoke to Leslie Kane about how her her um, book and Netflix series Surviving Death, there's this idea that people who have these near death experiences or NDEs seem more open and susceptible to paranormal or psychic phenomena it seems like a door gets opened to the afterlife or whatever that may be and when you come back it doesn't completely close does that sound right to you yeah i think i think for me it just opened wider because i was already open and sure, yeah. it was like oh oh the floodgates are open okay she's she's definitely going to experience more now um 
Yeah, and that's what I've gotten a lot. So reading other books and stuff about NDEs and, you know, other people have shared their experiences with me that um, what I experienced was, you know, along the same lines as some others. Some of, some of the things aren't the same. It took me a long time to get answers of what I did experience. And um, it was an interesting moment because, well, I saw Blackness. So I was completely surrounded in absolute dark. There was no light where I went, but it was the best place of love and peace. Um, I usually do start tearing up and crying. I don't have waterproof mascara on right now, so I hope I don't. But um, it's so much love and peace that when I think about it, my body can't contain the emotion because it's so beautiful. So it comes out in tears. Um, But yeah, my family was around me and I knew they were there. I just couldn't see them. And so everything I was experiencing was in blackness. And so I didn't understand for a very long time, like, why didn't I have this experience that other people did where they, you know, saw Jesus and they saw their family and they saw these colors and I got black. I got Mm. a void. (laughs) Um, So I finally got the answers one day and it was just, I will 100% cry. Um, it's just so beautiful because I did all, I was also raised in a religious household, um, very religious community. So a lot of people are Catholic. I was raised Presbyterian. And, uh, you know, when I go back and I visit my family at home, I, you know, my daddy is a preacher, he's a lay minister. So I get to go listen to his, his sermons. And I love listening to him talk and sitting in the congregation. I'm always going to be in awe of him, but, um, uh, so I was informed I was actually getting ordained by the Order of Melchizedek and Reverend Dan was ordaining a lot of a handful of us and he was talking about a lot of his experiences. So first off, in the state of Virginia, which is where I live, if you practice Reiki, which I'm also a Reiki master, um, if you have a paying client um, giving you money for your service and you put your hands on them at all, which sometimes you do in Reiki, Um, it's considered a religious practice. And so you have to be ordained in order to do that. So I got ordained. And um, so we're all listening to Reverend Dan's um, stories. And a lot of his stories paralleled with some of mine. And I'm in awe at his journey and what he's done and what he's taught. And and so he got to his near-death experience and mentioned seeing black. And my hand went right up. And, and so I asked him, uh, what, why, like, well, I, I saw blackness as well. And, and this was almost 10 years to the day. So 10 years to the day of my dear death experience, we were just like a few weeks shy of, of 10 years. And he said, well, uh, before God turned on light, there was darkness. So, uh, what you experienced was pure love and where you went was before when God turned on the lights. And so I, yeah, I cannot talk about this without crying because it's so beautiful. And so, um, yeah, so magical. Like I get to be a part of this magical world and I got kicked out of heaven to come back and tell these stories and help people know that if they've experienced this, you're not crazy. It is love where you went and we have to come back to this place where there's all this hate and, you know, I could care less if people are making fun of me for crying right now. It's like we're real people and I'm here to, to share this love and this light. And um, the near death experience was definitely profound for me um, for many ways. And I'm thankful enough that I remember so much of it. I remember coming back to my body. I remember hearing what the doctors were saying. I remember the nurse telling me she needed to call my parents after um, I finally got in the ICU and they had me stable and I had a port to my heart. I got a scar on my neck from a port that went to my heart. And um, I remember thinking to the nurse, don't call my parents. You're just going to freak them out. Like God done told me I'm going to be okay. Didn't, Didn't everybody else hear God say that? And Um, and so finally the nurse asked three times and I had to oblige, um, because you know, my, my ex at the time didn't know what to do. Like he didn't know what to tell my parents. And 
And so I finally said, yeah, give them a call. Um, but yeah, my, my perspective in life hasn't changed since before it, but my ability to see that there's more in the world and that love is infinite and that change is always inevitable and love is always infinite. Um, that, uh, that we're here, I'm here part of all of this for a reason. So that really digressed and I'm kind of sorry for that, but also not sorry. No, that's all right. I, and I greatly appreciate you sharing that as well, uh, sharing that as well Sarah. Um, I've not made many guests cry, so uh, uh, but, uh, do you know what? You made yourself cry. That's fine. And and you say yeah, that was that was all on me. <laughs> and right, right now this is recorded, so no one's making fun of you. When it's published, I can't promise you, but people be nice in the comments. Yeah, bring uh, it on. Folks are, do you know what? There's so many more nice folks than negative. So leave a nice comment. Um, a couple of ways to go with that then, and just to touch on because I, I don't think you mentioned. The actual NDE came about because you were you were going under. Was it anesthetic you were under? And yeah, something uh, went it was wrong. a routine. Yeah, routine sinus surgery. I had a very bad deviated septum, so I was getting a septoplasty, and the surgery went well. Recovery room part did not. I first woke up, and when I wake up from surgeries, I ask for stickers because that's what happens. And I was holding my stickers and I was like, can I go back to sleep now? And the nurse said, yeah, that's fine. I'll wake you up in a minute. And uh, so I closed my eyes holding my stickers. I was super proud of them. And she, I heard her say, oh, she's not breathing. And I was like, who's not? Like, I, I didn't see anybody else around here. I pray that they're okay. And it was me. So Thank you. likely Just theory is anesthesia issue. Just to clear that up, because I, I know you'd forgot just to mention that. So thank you just for bringing that one in, because people would be shouting at me. What happened to Sarah? Why was there an NDE? Um, <laughs> yeah. Now, let's let's kind of bring this slowly back to NHI, um, because I, the, the topics are linked for me. Um, you have had these experiences growing up uh, and psychic phenomena, whatever you want to call them. That They're all just different labels for something unknown or outside of the normal. Did you ever think of it in terms of it being a, a non-human intelligence when you had any kind of ghost type scenarios or psychic phenomena? And I'm right in saying it does come down to you. You believe you have had interactions with species that aren't human. I had my first uh, NHI come to me during a meditation. I think it was during the the shutdown in 2020, the COVID shutdown. Um, kind of didn't surprise me because I knew that they worked with us and I I was surprised at the um, clarity, like how I saw them and I could feel the love that emanated from her. It was a her. And since then I've definitely had other encounters during healing sessions even where they want to they want to help heal us and help heal earth and make um, earth more of what it should be, which is operating from love and light. And I've then progressed to, I have had, it's, it's just, I keep looking, I'm, I'm not used to just being so open about all this, but it, this video is out there. It's posted on um, my Facebook business page, but during a ghost hunt, um, I actually, uh, an NHI was present in the ghost hunt. So, and then the people I was, uh, uh, being doing mediumship and people that had the gadget, they would, I would say like, there's something over there. It's, you know, so tall and it's like long arms and, um, panned over and in the <clears throat> technology that was, um, being used, you could see what I was describing. Um, so that was my first encounter, especially it was, somebody's knocking at my door and it just scared me. <laughs> Sorry. Is, it, is um, it someone physically knocking at your door or? I, yes, I think so. I work on to let that go. Um, sorry, I don't, I don't have visitors very much. So that okay. scared me, especially during the day. Cause I would normally be at work right now. Um, sorry. It's all right. So uh, it was my first time having an NHI show up. It was like a live audience. You could also see it on the, the technology that was being used and I was describing it. So um, that was 
That was pretty cool. That was memorable. So usually when I do spiritual work, there is a data dump. So I don't remember a lot of what is provided to me. I joke that there's only so much vacancy up here. And so spirit knows that I also don't need to retain stuff because it's private for clients, right? So I don't need to like remember something that's so intimate and private in their life. Uh, so I do get a very quick data dump, um, sometimes even hours after a session. If I don't write it down, I'll forget it. Um, but there are a few times when there's a few tidbits that I will remember. And that was definitely one of them. Um, and even like seeing it on, uh, it was an SLS camera um, that you could see what I was describing. It was really neat, but that is, yeah, super cool. I'm making a note to check out the video when I get a chance after this. Um, if people can see me looking off to the side, notepad and mm -hmm. pen. Um, so on that, do you think there's any correlation between you having that first NHI experience during meditation being in 2020 when you're you're with the task force during that time and the actual work you're carrying out? Um, to me, it wasn't one or, you know, it wasn't, like what you were asking to me, it was just my spiritual work and what was happening. I never thought about a correlation between the two, honestly, until um, I guess it was probably either from Lou Elizondo or it could have been from another coworker that was on the task force that also had some experiences in talking with them. Um, I, I really never thought the two correlated with each other just because my life is um, so synchronistic with a lot of things. Um, and then I had a visitor in my room one night that I did talk about um, with Ross on his interview that really made me wonder what was going on. And it was protecting me basically and, and doing protective maneuvers in my bedroom. Um, but because of my spiritual world and, you know, like I mentioned earlier, seeing things in my sleep and, and things being in the room, that it didn't alarm me or set bells off because I know whatever's here in my house is of love and light. So, um, yeah, that's an interesting question. And I'm sorry, I'm not, it's not like a yes or no, um, but no. I never thought about correlating them until recently. Just in case folks haven't seen the interview with Ross and people go and check that out, um, it's really, really good. Uh, what was the visitor in the room? Huh. Um, the visitor, it was a, a bluish purple being, and it had uh, no hair, ridges on the sides of its head. So it was nighttime, so I couldn't fully tell you what actual official color the skin was. It definitely looked like a bluish, almost like iridescent um, sheen of purple to it. Um, no ears, holes for ears. Um, kind of like, uh, you mentioned Harry Potter earlier, kind of like a Voldemortish nose, but it was like a little bit, um, not quite so flat like Voldemort. Um, and it had this, uh, kind of best I could describe it is more like a Star Trek type uniform on like very plain, um, very plain clothing, but it was definitely a uniform of sorts and a uh, darker color because it was, you know, nighttime. So it was darker color than no. Um, and a sword. And the sword was gorgeous. Uh, it was more of like a crystal type material and kind of changed and morphed and glowed. And um, but it marched, basically, it was marching back and forth in my bedroom. And um, so one of my cats, Krypton, he see spirit. He has fought spirits for me. He sees uh, my best friend that I mentioned earlier that had passed away. So he visits, but um, my friend also saw my cats when he was alive. So they're also familiar with them. And so when he comes and visits, I know when Krypton sees him because it's like, it's weird, but he responds positively to him. So I know my cat's behavior, right? Um, and Krypton sat up in bed and I'm like, I'm still asleep, right? This is a vivid dream, like wake myself up. And so then I'd realized pretty quickly that I was actually awake and this entity was legit walking in my room and Krypton was staring at it. So I'm looking at him, seeing if he's aggressive or if he's, you know, protecting me and, and angry. And it was just like, oh, 
okay, I'll just continue to watch. Like he was just going back and forth watching the entity. And I asked, I started asking a bunch of questions like, Hey, what are you doing here? Do you need some water? You need a sleeping bag? How long are you staying? Like what's going on here? And it was like a guard at the London palace, like straight on, not acknowledging me. He's on a mission. Like, all right. And then at one point there was like a, a glow, like a kind of like a portal opened up near one of my windows and he wasn't too far from a window. And it was like a, like a pinkish glow. And he stopped and he looked and kind of looked like he was being talked to. And this was, was very brief and the portal went away and he continued walking and Krypton's like watching this whole thing too. And Court, my other cat, you know, homeboy will sleep through anything. The house would be on fire. And he's like, I'm going to die here because I'm comfortable. So he did, wasn't moving. And uh, Krypton eventually just laid back down to go back to sleep. But I'm like, all right. And I de definitely didn't feel anything bad coming from it. So I knew nothing bad would be in my house. So I laid back down and said, you know, if you need water, I guess you know where everything's at and went back to sleep. So interesting you say you don't uh, nothing would be coming in. Uh, you mentioned love and light's a phrase I find divisive because some people when they talk about the UFO topic will say they are in constant contact with love and light beings and everything in the UFO topic is positive and there's no there's no black and white. Everything is great on one side of it. And I don't think that's a fair way to look at it. Would you say, though, it sounds like you're talking that there are entities or NHI which aren't positive? Correct. Yes, there definitely are. Um, not all of them wants, wants what's best for Earth or for the, the world. So um, one or two questions then. One of them uh, is, actually, I'm going to go back to one you mentioned when you first started talking before about um, the NHI work with us. And I'm just curious what you meant by it in what way. Oh, good question. So uh, a lot of the benevolent beings wants what, wants what is best for us on Earth, for our best and highest good. And they want us to get back to a place where, um, you know, Earth doesn't have wars. Because apparently at one point, from what I have been told in some meditations, that we once were a harmonious planet and we operated in higher dimensions. And um, so they want us to get back to that, to, to where we should be and trying to help us go along that path. And there's a handful of other, I'll call them famous people out there that are very open facing about um, these beings coming here and, you know, Earth's awakening and getting us back to a fifth dimension. So like the Dolores Cannon, people have asked me about books and stuff. So Dolores Cannon is amazing. She is unfortunately passed away, but um, her legacy is being continued. And she is uh, like some of her videos are just amazing to listen to of the goodness that she knows is coming here on this earth on on um and yeah on this planet so um the beings that i have worked with are trying to help get to that state but also we we for all of our amazing technology m medical technology or you know cell phones everything we've come a long way and we still have so far to go um I was just talking with a family member earlier this week about how little we actually know about or even our own brains. And we were discussing about um, concussions and the, mm. <laughs> the potential side effects of those decades later. Um, like we really don't know much about our own bodies um, for how much we also do know at the same time. Um, so yeah, so the benevolent beings are just trying to help us along this path and Maybe not nudge isn't the right direction, but encourage and there for us as well. Is it fair to remind the audience right now that anyone, anything you're talking about just now in terms of beings isn't from your work with the UAPTF or anything you've done there? This is through your spirituality and the work you've done from that point Correct. of view. Yep. Yeah. So yeah. there we go. Um, and you mentioned, and one thing, people do get in touch with me from all, all sides of the UFO conversation, and I'll hear about sightings, I'll hear about people who have never seen anything but want to see something, 
I'll hear about folks who have experience with beings, they'll say are positive, and I'll hear about negative beings as well. And I'm always happy to listen to people's stories, but I think this might be a good time for anyone who, who does have those sorts of experiences. One, you mentioned the positive positive side of things that you experience and how you, you get a feeling and that's all right, but you mentioned as well there are protections and, and things you can do or rituals to put in place that may help someone who feel and I've I've had these emails from folks who feel they're being visited or experiencing something poten potentially more negative. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. So one hot oh well, sorry, let me collect my thoughts. So yes, definitely negative out there. I have encountered in some of my spiritual uh, I don't know, not even adventures. We'll call it an adventure. I like that. So in my spiritual adventures, I have definitely come across negative NHI. And um, for some reason, I have an ability to ask them questions and they usually answer. Um, so I know of some, why some are here and why they're not. And then, of course, I go to Google or I talk to some of my other friends who are also mentors or, or my teachers and um, ask them more questions and then they validate of things that I ended up getting on my own, giving me another layer of validation about them being negative and why they're here. So one way, so this, I'll bring up, I'll, I'll talk about protection now. Um, cause I have gotten that quite a bit of, uh, questions from people. Um, one super duper easy way to protect yourself is to imagine a bubble around you, a bubble of love and light and this love and light, no matter what your religion is, if you're if your your high if your source is your higher self, and you maybe pray to yourself, um, that love um, from God's love and light or source's love and light can come out of your heart and envelop you in a bright bubble of light. And uh, so that light is protection. So a lot of spiritual work, especially early on when I started, it's about using your imagination and having intent. So having the intent to not allow anything to harm you is actually amazing. And it's helpful because we are more powerful than them. We have a body, we are here. This is our experience on earth, not theirs. And so we have the ability to, to kind of send them away. Not all the time, but, um, but yeah, imagining this bubble. And so for kids, so there's a, a lot of my clients have kids that have abilities and they're like, we don't know, like, my kid's three years old. I don't know how to tell them to imagine a bubble. And I'm like, well, have them tell them that there's, you know, imagine a bubble and you step into it. Like they can, it's, it's still the intent, right? And you can, you could send these bubbles to pets. And, and I also like to ask Archangel Michael. So Archangel Michael or St. Michael is a protector and he's God's protector or source or whatever. He's a very powerful angel and so you can ask him for protection too. So something simple that I like to say, and it varies from what I'm ask, asking protection for, whether it be while I'm doing this this with you right now and um, might be getting some attacks from, from others, some negative attacks or something. I protect myself before I do speaking. Um, so I ask Archangel Michael to only allow love and light in my space, either on my property, in my house, over my pets. You could even ask for protection on your car while you're driving. Um, so you ask for protection of love and light and everything else is not allowed in and it is banished now. And sometimes I'll take a deep breath. And then when I exhale, I'll imagine all the negative stuff going away. And then I'll take another deep breath and I'll inhale goodness that'll come in. And then when I exhale again, everything else is swiped away. So. Um, very, very simple things. And um, when you start doing stuff with intent, it really makes a difference. I'm going to get to listener questions very soon because I appreciate you've been with me for a long time and a lot of folks, Sarah, sent in stuff. But I, I really have to ask, so you're someone who has, for you, you've got direct proof of an afterlife. You know, you've had that experience, that NDE. You've also seen videos and data that had convinced you of an existence of non-human intelligence, including your own beliefs and your, your background in academia. With all that in mind, right now, if someone comes up to you in the street or a friend says, you know, sitting down over a coffee or a drink, you know, this, this UFO stuff, what exactly is going on? How, how do you answer that question with all that experience? 
Um, I guess that varies on what the question and the context is. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to give you a more specific varies. one then, because we are right now a couple of weeks away from congressional hearings again on the UFO topic on November 13th. So you may get some friends who are out of touch with the UFO thing or just dipping their toe in the water for the first time. And you're going to get someone saying, Sarah, that, that's UFO stuff, you know, is this real? Have we really got aliens here? It'll be something like that, won't it? Yeah, uh, I would tell them, yeah, we're not alone. And I would mention my uh, thing, same thing I would say in undergrad of infinite amount of space. Why would we, we be selfish enough to think we're the only ones in, in infinite space? And say, you know, I, yeah, I've, I've seen the data. I've seen some of what is being discussed. And uh, without a doubt in my mind, we're not alone. And it shouldn't be a secret. I don't know why it's a secret that that we're not alone. But, you know, the truth is here. The truth isn't just out there anymore. It is here. It is now. Great question. Uh, great answer to that question. And I'm going to get to listener questions now, Sarah. Um, Try to have short answers. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, listen, I, I'm just double checking some of them. Uh, we might have touched on already, but we'll get through these. And then there was so much I wanted to speak to you about. I would have had you here for like four or five hours. I've condensed a little quick fire round right at the end, just to touch on a few things to get yeah. quick thoughts on as well. But again, thank you folks that, if you sent over a question. Um, I'll get Sarah back on if she's, if she's enjoyed herself to get through more of them. Um, but first question from Gnosis says, have you seen the high resolution HD or 4K video that has been claimed to exist by other people with clearances? There's a rumored long video, some say 23 minutes. Um, no, I don't think I have. I've seen some good quality data. I don't think I've watched anything for 23 minutes, though. Okay. How does the quality of materials you saw compare to the 2017 videos that the Tic Tac Gimbal go fast? Uh, some of them are much, much better, especially, uh, oh, oh, no, caught me. Um, Almost. <laughs> some, of them are, yeah, some of them are much better. I'm sorry. I'm going to be giggling about that for a little bit. Um, some of them are definitely much better, uh, but also some of them are the same because some of those sensors are, haven't changed either. So. Do you know the most annoying thing for me? I've never said this before on the podcast. When I speak to guests who I know have seen various pieces of footage or data, etc. And when I'm talking about it, you'll probably have that playing in your head as an image anyway. So right now you're probably thinking about that video. Yes. And it's just like, <laughs> yeah, if I could remote view, that would be fantastic. You know, just something yeah. that I could read in mind that would be great. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's a frustration. Um, and I like this question still from Gnosis asks, what would you say to those who worry that those on the inside have not actually seen anything that would be classed as unequivocal, unequivocal and undeniable if declassified? Um, what would I say to those who haven't seen something declassified? No, no. So uh, what they're saying is, you know, there are people who worry that people on the inside haven't actually seen anything startling oh. or real genuine proof. And I think that even includes some of these senators and yeah. congressmen and women who are okay. coming out saying wow i've just seen something incredible mm -hmm. well um i mean this is kind of a narrow scope of the broader intel community right like most of the intel community is looking at terrorism and um fighting battles uh, that m most never know that are being fought while we sleep at night i can honestly say i i have fought against more terrorism than i ever realized i would in my career so looking at UAP videos, I think is mostly of one of like the, the curiosity and the, the fun flair, the side of things. So it's not something that would just come up in a meeting while I'm discussing, uh, you know, ISIS movements and where we need to monitor next and where they might have a hub somewhere. UAPs don't come up. So it doesn't surprise me that not a lot have seen what I have, even though I've probably seen just a fraction of what's out there. Awesome. A lot of folks said I sent in questions, including uh, Agent Black and Jacob and many more around a comment you made on the Good Trouble show with Matt Ford um, about the, and I think you did with Ross potentially as well, I'm not sure, about the jellyfish UAP. 
So this yeah, was a that was video. with uh, Vinny on Disclosure team and and Vinny. Um, but you you yeah. did mention it on a couple of others as well. Um, so oh. the Jellyfish UAP video is the one that's filmed in an active war zone. It looks like it's a really weird looking shape. And it looks like it has stuff hanging down. People say jellyfish because yeah. if you imagine jellyfish tentacles and whatnot. <laughs> now, mm-hmm. yeah. Now, I believe you said that it was something prosaic and it isn't something anomalous. Um, it is. <sighs> so, I have been getting a lot of, I'll call it blowback from this, but it is, it is not a UAP. Um, it is something that I can't discuss what it is. The analysis is unclassified or it is classified. I did not do the analysis. Uh, it was a, another group that did it. And I would not be saying this with high confidence on camera if I didn't trust it, because that is a lot of people are asking if I trust. And I just like, why would I risk my life and my career if I didn't trust what I'm saying? Um yeah, it is not a UAP. I can't discuss what it is, but it is. What's well, my cat? I don't know if you heard Krypton meowing, but he's here. That's all right. <laughs> but it is not a UAP. Okay. Uh, and just to follow up on that, because uh, I have to, you had mentioned that it was Aquarius Life, was one of the comments. Yeah. Um, I definitely wasn't talking about the same video. (laughs) I didn't think so, because uh, immediately I was thinking what type of Aquarius life would be floating around potentially in the sky. 100% not thinking it was the same thing at all. A few folks brought that up, and that that's absolutely yeah. fine. So thank you for clearing so that I up. Am, I am sorry. I have learned lessons. I will ask for clarification on questions. Um, I will take a sip of water and, <laughs> and process. Sarah, this is an incredibly dif- difficult topic to navigate, and I think you're doing as well yeah. as anyone, so don't worry. Uh, thank um, you. So I suppose just from a, a conversational point of view, you have mentioned that you weren't happy with these types of leaks. And I wonder if you could expand on that. Um, uh, your your statement was something like, it's uh, the, the videos like that are 5% of what this is. And you feel stuff like this, these leaks are hurting versus helping us. Yes. Um, thank you for bringing it up. I am very passionate about what I do in my work. And I am upset that somebody has been wanting to leak really hard work that people have done. So think about if an author writes a book, let's say it's 100 chapters. And of course, a lot of love, a lot of passion, a lot of research, a lot goes into writing this book, you have to do edits, and you have to do so much behind it. Um, The publisher decides to only put out two random chapters out of the hundred. You got chapter three and you got chapter 77. And then one photo that goes along with chapter 50. So that's basically what's being disclosed. It's not a whole story. It is a snapshot. And those snapshots do look pretty good. And I can't discuss about some of the other improper leaks that have happened that aren't UAPs. Um, But we could talk about the jellyfish because that's what's happening. And that's what I was discussing about when I brought it up. So yeah, that looks pretty crazy. I, there's no doubt in my mind that that don't look cray cray, but there's so much more to the work that went behind it. There's so much more to the video. And I just, I'm, I, I cannot discuss what it is because that is, classified um i will just say that it is not a uap and a lot of work went into looking into that video what does come across is how frustrated you are with that kind of stuff happening um is it fair to say that these leaks are deliberate attempts at disinformation or misinformation or is it stupidity laziness whatever you want to call it that's a that's such a good question. And I asked myself that and I've talked to some other colleagues that also, uh, you know, um, when we talk at work uh, in a classified environment, 
on why somebody would do this. And I really, it boils down to, we don't know. I'm not that person. I don't know what they're going through. I don't know if they're trying to help, if they're trying to debunk. Um, I don't blame any of the media for putting the stuff out because it does look crazy, (laughs) but they're not getting the story that goes along with it or the analysis that goes along with it or the conversations that were spoken to the camera operators or the drone operators. Um, So it it is very frustrating because I have had some of my work that I worked on months to do leaked and it be completely inaccurate. And I can't say a thing about it. Given the nature of what this would turn out to be, would we, the public, ever find out what it is? Or is it just that won't happen? It's just, it's classified, that's it. I I honestly don't know. I I really, I, I get frustrated just as the public does. Like, I wish some of this could be disclosed. That's why I'm talking. That's why I'm trying to validate other people of that we're not alone. Um, and to hopefully nudge that needle over to a side to where, yeah, we can actually make some of these things unclassified or we could at least speak about them publicly. Um, that would be great. A good time for a question from Stephen, which asks then on that note, what was Sarah's motivation for coming forward and what concerns, if any, did she have about doing so? Um, concerns, I, I mean, all of it, um, my life, I have gone through not pleasant things since I came out on the Good Trouble show with Matt Ford. I don't wish what some of the things I've gone through on anybody, um, you know, I wouldn't risk my life and my career if I didn't truly believe in my words that I'm saying. Um, what nudged me to come out was honestly, you know, Lou's book is behind me. I loved it. I, I soaked up so many of his words that resonated with me and that also made puzzle pieces fall in place on what I was going through um, with the task force and then the transition to arrow and um i it would it to me it felt like the right time and i will be a part of james fox's film i'm not in it a ton so don't don't y'all think i'm gonna have like this this amazing long segment on it but um you know i I want the truth out there and with the disclosure act happening a while you know last month i just thought like maybe i'll help be able to be an advocate. So a lot of a lot of things like ended up lining up in my life to be able to be brave enough to come forward. Cause if you were to talk to me a year ago, I I could not have. I was healing, I was recovering from a knee surgery and I, you know, had a lot of things happening in life and I didn't have the time or energy to do this. And so now I do. And do you know of more Sarah Gams who may be texting, emailing or calling you? who potentially could come out themselves? Uh, I haven't. I mean, I know of a handful of others, but I know they don't want in any type of limelight or starlight or whatever kind of light this might be, ring light. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, good, good one. Yeah. Right. Um, but I, I hope, like, I'm happy to be a voice for others too. So if they want me to speak their words for them. That's not going to be the first time I've spoken for others. So I'm happy to do that. And I hope more do come out. I have been getting a flood of experiences and shared details of some similar things that I have spoken about. And that is absolutely incredible. I feel so honored that people trust their stories with me. Um, But it's also overwhelming because there's all this goodness that's happening and there's still this stigma. So I hope, I hope we're all knocking that down. Uh, Dave Smethurst sent a few questions, a few Hail Marys. Um, So the first one was, Arrow used a very high bar of scientific analysis, in my view, to avoid drawing any conclusion about the exotic nature of the observed UAP. Using a more intelligence-like assessment, what things did Sarah observe that were things our um, our current technology could not do? Uh, I would say the maneuverability, definitely. And that's, you know, I know I'm not the first person saying this, um, but the maneuverability and the, um, and I'll call it like a, in quotes, like playfulness of uh, the objects. And I say playfulness because I'm 
I'm not a pilot dealing with seeing this in the air. So I'm sure that was not playful to them. Mm. Um, but I, the maneuverability, like the G forces and stuff, the stopping and the turning and the pivots and 90 degree turns that are on a dime, there's, um, you know, that's not a balloon. That's not uh, anything here. So I think that's probably the most I think about when people ask me that question. A little follow up on that then is in her estimation, how many years in advance of our tech were they and did the tech differ? Um, exponentially. I mean, they understand quantum physics way. We're just starting to crack the code on quantum. And, and sometimes we get you know pushed back. We do a few backward steps and then we'll take a leap forward. So, uh, I mean, they're exponentially more understanding of physics and I mean, even gravitational forces of um, being able to do, you know, like the cool shielding that the Marvel movies have on their ship and stuff like that. Like that's, that's in a sci-fi movie and just think like that's actually real somewhere. How cool is that? Very cool. Um, <laughs> it must be so much fun. This is just for me having your passion and interest in the UFO topic and getting to do that job. Like that's like if I got to do a day's work experience and you took me in with you to look at videos and pictures for the day, like, That'd be incredible. Um, on that, the the Hive asks, have you seen the video of the Mosul Orb? Yes. Is that in a private capacity or professional? Professional. Professional. Um, the what, the follow-up to that is, what was the analysis of the UAP task force of that video? I cannot discuss that. It is unfortunately classified. To be fair, that's two hours and one minute we've been recording, Sarah, and it's the first time you've said that. So I'm pretty impressed with myself that that's the first time mm -hmm. I've I've got that from you. So I'm more than happy with that at this rate. Mm -hmm. um, uh, also, have you seen other similar orb videos in the task force archive that you analyze and haven't been released? Yes. I'll follow up. How common are orbs as a shape? I would say that's probably the most common shape. Yeah. yeah. And we're talking round balls, not discs, yep. you know. Yep. Cool. Yeah, I don't, I don't think I have. Oh, I do have something round. Here we go. Cool. <laughs> Labrador 8. <laughs> yeah. Which I get a disc from above. Looks like, you know, could be a sphere. But yeah, that's yeah. fine. Um, Johnny asks, did she ever collaborate with anyone within the UK government during her time in the job? I did not. You did not. You did mention on, oh, and I'm getting my stuff mixed up. With, I think it was with Ross on News know. Nation. Yeah. Um, I did. Um, I mentioned it with Matt, and then I think it was Ross. No, it was Vinny because Vinny is Vinny? Vinny's over there. Um, but I did clarify that I should have gone in more depth, but I it was just going to Google. I was helping a friend trying to figure out a paper for a thesis and for a master's program, and we started talking about databases of UAP stuff and. So what I found was just on the Google machine and anybody technically could go do that. Did you ever get any sense of why the US seems to be so public about this conversation? You know, it's on Fox, CNN, NBC, and I'm, and I'm in the UK, right? I'm in England from Scotland, but I'm in England. And we don't get a sniff of this in the UK. Even the, the biggest stories, I suppose, um, the Grush story from last year, we had a four day window where the press, the serious press had an interest, not a major interest, but an interest. Um, and there was a small interest when Lou Elizondo's book came out a few weeks ago. Other than that, there's no, no inkling that this is a, a thing politically or in the mainstream or in the news. Any ideas why you think that is? Um, I think, I mean, we're just, <laughs> maybe more persistent here. I don't know. I, I, I really am not sure why it's like such a easier thing to discuss here. Um, maybe with the, the crashes in the forties that happened, um, you know, there was a lot of publicity there, but I know stuff has happened overseas and in the UK. I really don't know. That's a good question. And I here's think... Krypton. Oh, there we go. First appearance from the cats. Hello to the cat Krypton. There we go. Um, and you know, maybe. specifically, I do like to think maybe in the UK they're just better at keeping secrets, but you know, that's debatable, uh, depending on what side of the argument you fall. Um, mm -hmm. a final, final listener question from Mr. Calhoun 
Does Sarah think there are any telltale signs expressed in those that are more connected or susceptible to the phenomenon? And I suppose within that, we can include like, spirituality. So people have particular traits or tells. Can you repeat that? Yeah, so does Sarah think there are any telltale signs expressed in those that are connected with the phenomenon? Um, that are connected, you mean like kind of like I am or? The, the way I'm reading that is either personality traits or there's something about them, something like that. And I suppose that could connect to the, the spirituality side of things. I don't know. Um, any signs? I, I really, I, I don't know what signs there would be. And I don't, I don't want to call any of my friends out for being like, oh, well, that person has this trait and so that they're open. Um, so yeah, I don't know that answer. Well, I'm going to ask you one more thing because I just missed it and then we'll finish off on the quick fire because you'll be having to go to bed soon at this point, Sarah. So I appreciate you being with us a long time. <laughs> I might and... go hiking. That sun is bright in here. So <laughs> I might well, go out to the woods. And this is true then, folks. Actually, when I came in to record this, it was sunny outside. It will now be pitch black. So that's how long me and Sarah have been recording. Um, yeah. So final question then from Christian, and maybe this is more relevant for you with the physics background and the data driven side of things. Has Sarah seen specific radio frequencies that UAP emit? Example would be the 1.6 gigahertz in Skinwalker Ranch. I had a guy from the Air Force tell me they can identify UAP by the frequency they emit and even went as far as saying they are different NHI. So from my work on the task force, no, because we didn't look at frequencies like that. We looked at the imagery and at the videos. Um, from my other knowledge I've gained, especially from watching Skinwalker Ranch, I love all the data that they have on there. Um, yes, but I would have seen the same thing that you guys have because it's Skinwalker and it's a show and the data's out there. Awesome. So Sarah, I've got, I think, four things here. Uh, I'm just looking for your thoughts on, they can be as quick or as long as you like, um, but I appreciate we're very much getting towards the end of our time. Um, so the first one has been the big piece of news from the last sort of week, and that is the Immaculate Constellation UAP Crash Retrieval Program. I'm glad you're nodding, um, and I just wonder, can we get your thoughts on that? I was not aware of it until two weeks ago, um, and I... Not surprised about it whatsoever. So I there's a lot of uh, SAP or special programs that are out there that I am not read into, and I'm happy about that. I joke that ignorance is bliss because some of the stuff that I've learned over the years, I do kind of wish that I would not have been a privy to. Um, so yeah, so I wasn't surprised by it at all. That's fair. Um, would programs like that have used? your expertise or something like the UAP task force's expertise or would they be so buried and classified they wouldn't have wanted to be involved with you? Uh, I, this is my opinion, right? Yeah. Um, I do believe that other task force members likely would have been utilized, but I was just on, you know, supported from one small corner yeah. of it that I, there was no need for me to know. Uh, would would they even know they were being utilized for that? Or could it just be, here's something, we need you to look at it, get it done, and then give us what you've got? I mean, I guess it could be. If you if you don't know, you don't know, then you don't have to sign an NDA and read read somebody into the program. So yeah, I guess yeah, okay. that, that could be a thing. Uh, your thoughts on the upcoming hearings in Congress uh, scheduled for November 13th? I am so excited. I cannot wait to watch. I hope I'll be able to watch. I'm actually going to be on vacation overseas during the time of the hearings, but I will be with some like-minded people that hopefully we will all be watching. We are. But la last two things. Uh, so the first one, have you seen much or or care about the Nazca mummies story? I What I've seen is what everybody else has. And I think it's really cool. Uh, I, Again, I'll talk about being a hopeful person and that I, I don't understand why people would dupe us or, you know, say inaccurate things other than, you know, clicks and maybe attention or whatever. So I'm hopeful that there's that's real. <laughs> I think that's what I'm at as well. I would love it to be genuine um, because, wow, but 
we have to wait and see still on that one. Uh, yeah. And finally, uh, you mentioned James Fox's The Program, which I know James had an update yesterday online, uh, yesterday being the 21st of October, to see he was having some big meetings in LA uh, with some potential providers. I hope James lands a really good deal for that because I've said many times he's got a family. He spends a lot of time away from his, his child to go and do the work he does and he got absolutely shafted financially and his last documentary by the company as well um Horrible. what are your what are your hopes for the program as a documentary and what it can achieve um i just got goosebumps thinking about it it's of course really good james does amazing work and uh, yes what he has gone through is just gut-wrenching i can't imagine being in his shoes and i uh, I do know it'll be released, he keeps saying, before the end of the year. So I've seen it, and or at least a version. I think it was maybe a version or two ago, but it is it's such good work. And you could tell the passion behind it, even the passion behind the the people with the cameras in, in their hands. Um, I, I'm excited. I really do hope this, whatever he, his meetings are, I, I, I'm hopeful for the best. Again, lots of hope. Lots of hope. Um, listen, Sarah, you have been phenomenal with your time today because we have gone well over two hours and we started talking before that as well. And I think your cats are getting a bit bored that I've had you now for so long. Um, do you want to just finish up letting people know um, about your website and how they can get in touch with you if they want to? Yes, thank you. So my website is a work in progress, but you can reach out to me from there. It is sarahgracewarrior.com. I am on Instagram, Sarah Grace Warrior, all one word, and on Facebook, Sarah Grace Psychic Medium, I, I think is what I pop up on, on Facebook. Um, I did want to say I have gotten a lot of questions for um, who I went to for my spiritual training. So I do actually want to provide, if I could find it now, yeah, for, and I want to read it because I don't want to say um the wrong thing and of course now that i'm looking i'm not seeing oh my gosh um so celeste woods was my psychic medium teacher i will never ever say enough good things about her she was amazing and she was also open to a lot of my weird questions that i had and then also my science perspective um but celestewoods.com is her website and her email is mediumcelestewoods at gmail.com. So I did get permission from her to let everybody know who she is. But um, uh, thank you so much for everybody for your time and for staying open. And also, we appreciate the skeptics. So we need you too. For this episode, thank you very much for tuning in. Don't forget to leave the podcast a review on your chosen platform. Apple and Spotify do make a huge difference to the algorithm. If you're checking the show out on YouTube, please don't forget to like and leave a comment on here as well. Any sharing you do is very much appreciated on any social media platform. And finally, you can listen to shows ad-free and sponsor-free in their glorious full versions by subscribing for less than the price of a coffee on Apple, Spotify, just search that UF podcast premium youtube you can sign up and be a member or you can do that through patreon.com thank you very much for listening folks it wasn't a tic tac and not quite a saucer more like a hubcap designed by chaucer a little baroque and quite steampunk like alice was playing bass for the parliament of folk the little fucker hovered right outside of my window and when i shoved out the screen he made it an issue i don't think he expected me to see his ass but i'd had some champagne and smoked a little more ass.